Welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Bella and I am the Director of Development at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. Today, we remember and recognize that the Holocaust Center is in Seattle sits on the land of the Duwamish Nation. They are the indigenous people of metropolitan Seattle, having lived here as long as 115,000 years. I'm absolutely thrilled that over 700 lawyers and community members registered to join us from across the region for this important event examining the crime of complicity. This is the second CLE that we're doing as a part of our Lunch and Learn series, and I'm very excited to be able to do more in this coming year. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Home Street Bank, and to our community partners who helped spread the word about today's event. Thank you as well to our lawyers committee who helped with the outreach for this program. We will be taking questions at the end of today's presentation. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will go through them for the question and answer section. The Holocaust couldn't have happened without the millions of bystanders that stood by. And hopefully you guys can see this photo here. Here we have two Jewish men. One man is being forced to cut the other man's beard. His neighbors stood by and watched as he's humiliated in public. Some of them, as you can see, stood by with a smile. And some of them are even smiling for this photo. This is one of the many photos that you'll find from the Holocaust, showing neighbors watching neighbors as they're persecuted out in the public. In 2019, an eighth grade student came into the Holocaust Center on a field trip with her class. And during her tour, she learned that less than 1% of people were rescuers or upstanders during the Holocaust, hiding complete strangers or risking their lives to help their neighbors. Um, not very often as a director of development do I always get to engage with our students, but this particular time I was in the center and I got to meet this class and meet this student. And she asked me that day, if less than 1% of people were upstanders, what percent were bystanders or complicit? Didn't do anything wrong. Well, I asked this girl, well, what does it actually mean to be a bystander? And does sitting back while your friend is being bullied make you devoid of the crime? Well, at the Holocaust Center for Humanity, we see the lessons of the Holocaust as a universal message. We inspire students of all ages, like the girl I just mentioned, to confront indifference and bigotry, promote human dignity, and to take action. And today, more than ever, with everything that's happening in the world, these lessons could not be more important. Whether a student comes to the center on a field trip, joins us virtually, or has a survivor speak to their class, or even read the Holocaust book that was provided to them from a grant their teacher was given through our book by book small grant program. We want them to keep asking the difficult questions because we hope that these lessons will create a more empathetic and tolerant society. The work of the Holocaust Center, thanks to Senate Bill 5612, continues to grow and reach more students and teachers throughout Washington. Our resources and programs like today are all offered completely for free thanks to the generous support of individuals like yourself. So if you're feeling inclined and inspired today, please check out our website to support our increasing reach across the region. Now I'd like to introduce you to Kathy from our Lawyers Committee, who's going to introduce our speaker so we can get this program started. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. Yes. There you go. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kathy Feldman, and I'm an attorney at Car Title Campbell and a part of the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lawyers Committee that helps bring these legal programs to all of you. Thanks to the generosity of the Holocaust Center for Humanity for making this program freely accessible to the legal community and the public. Today's program will count for one Washington State Bar CLE credit. If you're here today to obtain this credit, please note the following. In order to receive the credit, you will need to attend the entire program. You'll need to fill out the post-event evaluation, which will ask you if you'd like CLE credit and ask you to submit your bar number. 
Please make sure to fill this out in the next two weeks after the event. The center is not allowed to send in attendance past one month after today's program. So if you miss the deadline, the center will not be able to give you credit for today's program. It's my pleasure today and honor to introduce our speaker, Amos Giora. Amos is professor of law at the University of Utah Law School. He's actively involved in bystander legislation efforts in Utah and other states around the country. His most recent books include Armies of Enablers, Survivor Stories of Complicity and Betrayal in Sexual Assaults, and The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander from the Holocaust to Today, which is what today's program covers. This book was also the basis of legislation that was just passed on March 5th in the state of Utah. Please welcome Professor Amos Giora. Up. I hope you can all hear me and now see me. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for hosting me and enabling me to have this conversation with you today about my book, The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander and the Holocaust. And if all works well to try to tie it to society today, but we need to begin with the book. In addition to Kathy's gracious introduction, a couple of more words about myself and how I came to the book. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Both of my parents are Holocaust survivors. And when they got married a zillion years ago, they made the decision not to share with their children anything about their Holocaust experiences. Their children being then a day me because I am an only child. When I was 12, my father took me canoeing and told me the following. In one minute, I will tell you my story. And in one minute, I will tell you your mother's story. And this is the first and last time we will ever have this conversation. And they meant what they said, and they said what they meant because we never discussed the Holocaust. And truth be told, I grew up in a home where I knew that they were Holocaust survivors, but I also grew up not knowing anything about my parents. And they were so locked in on this not sharing that when I was in college, I went to Kenyon College. My mentor was a Gentile, Professor Michael Evans, and he told me in my junior year, you know, at some point you need to come to grips with being Jewish, Judaism, the Holocaust and all that, bum, bum. I said, great, what do I do? And he said, oh, why don't you write an honors thesis about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? And I said, you know, Professor Evans, that's a great idea. What the hell is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? And that's to my everlasting shame that I literally knew nothing about the Holocaust. And I came home and I said to my parents, I said, hey, Professor Evans, who they love, says I need to write about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And my mother looked at my father and said, it's time for dinner. So they were serious about this. Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. 20 years ago, the Hungarian Catholic Church did a mea culpa under the auspices of the Vatican, in which they decided, you know, finally to address their role in the Holocaust. And they did this two or three day conference. The keynote speaker, um, by whose ever decision, had to be a world class academic who was a Holocaust survivor from Hungary and spoke Hungarian. And lo and behold, long story short, they asked my father, who uh, was indeed a world-class academic, to be the keynote speaker. And those were, their conditions were the following, that he'd be this, this, and this, but speak Hungarian. And my father said to them in return, well, if they have their conditions, he has his conditions. And his conditions were one, that he will speak the truth. And two, that he won't speak Hungarian. And after protracted negotiations, they finally agreed, they found the, the compromise. And my father gave this, what we now know was his extraordinary talk in Hungary under the auspices of the Vatican about the Holocaust. Um, the only reason I share this with you all is one, he never once mentioned the word Holocaust. And two, I never knew about this talk until shortly before his death because they really didn't want to share anything with me. About eight years ago, when I was training for the Salt Lake Marathon, 
my running partner, who's not Jewish, asked me when we were on one of those tw- endless, you know, 20 mile runs, which are awful, asked me, how did this being the Holocaust, how did this happen? And I had a brilliant academic answer, which was, I have no idea. I'm st- I will be 64 in May. I was 55, 56 then. And I came home and I said to myself, enough is enough. Da'enu in Hebrew. The time has come to learn about the Holocaust. And I never, ever, ever, ever say you read everything because you can't read any- everything about the Holocaust. I mean, just obviously. But the more I read, the more I read, and the more I realized there was one issue that had never really been addressed, and that was the role of the bystander in the Holocaust. There had been two books previously written, one um, by Victoria Barnett, who's a sociologist, and her book on the bystanders is an outstanding book. And the other book is by Hilberg, the great historian, uh, Perpetrators, Bystanders, and um, Victims. They were the only two who have addressed the question of the bystander. But what became clear to me that the question of the legal complicity, the legal status of the bystander in the Holocaust had never ever been addressed. And so for for better or for worse, I'm the first one to have written um, a book addressing this from the perspective of the law. So because you all are, are lawyers and we all know from first year of law school, the most important thing for lawyers is definitions. For me, the bystander is the person who is physically present, sees the peril of another, and makes the conscious decision not to act. So again, you have knowledge, and you have capability, and you're now presented with a dilemma. Do you or do you not act? And as um, Kathy graciously mentioned, the question um, of the law, indeed my involvement in, in the legislative effort, indeed is something I've been very involved in. And indeed on Friday, um, a few days ago, the Utah legislature in essence passed a bystander law imposing duty to, when you see vulnerable child and vulnerable adult and failure to do so results in criminal penalty. But back to the Holocaust. I decided that I want to address this question directly in Europe today and so what I was very fortunate, I got significant funding, which enabled me to spend time in Europe to understand the bystander directly. So I went to Germany, I went to Hungary because that's where both of my parents are from. And I went to Holland because I have many connections in Holland. My PhD is from Holland. And I think you can't address the Holocaust in Europe without addressing Holland. So how did I go about writing this and how does that you know, help us understand the role of the bystander? But before getting to that, I need to um, reference back to what, what uh, Nicole said, and she's 100% right. With all due respect to the perpetrators, Hitler and friends, without the bystanders, the Holocaust never happens. So I think moving forward, I really wish that you would think about this. Yes, there's the perpetrator, but in many ways, the perpetrator is not interesting. The truly interesting, the truly important person in this entire conversation is the bystander. All right, so let's begin with Hungary. My mother is literally the, the, the Budapest version of Anne Frank. And I saw, Nicole, you have the picture of Anne Frank. Uh, my mother was 12 years old in hiding in the attic with my grandmother. My grandfather was in a war camp in uh, the Ukraine. And my mother and grandmother were fed every day by an, by an elderly Catholic woman who risked life and limb by climbing up the stairs every day to bring them food until came the inevitable knock on the door, you know, knock, knock, knock. And they, my mother and grandmother were taken downstairs from their the attic to the courtyard to be shot. Um, they were saved um, incredibly by Jewish partisans who had stolen uniforms of the um, Iron Cross, the Arrow Cross, and were roaming the streets of Budapest at night wearing, the, wearing I mean, their uniforms, I mean, it was a ruse. And it, when they were able to save Jews, they would say to the Iron Cross, Arrow Cross, hey, leave these Jews to us and we'll take care of them. And that's how my mother and grandmother were saved the first time. And from there, and here's the role of the bystander. So my mother, who, as I was writing the book, finally shared some stories with me. She and my grandmother are running through the streets of Budapest, obviously Jewish because they have the yellow star. And they're frantically looking for a safe house. And my mother clearly remembers seeing Budapest Gentiles standing on the sidewalks, seeing them running and not offering any assistance. I need to add that both my mom 
and my dad, my dad died while I was writing the book. They both very much disagreed with me that the bystander owed them a duty because from their perspective, the bystander does not owe a duty to the other. And for the Gentile community of, of Budapest, the Jews were the others. Keep that in mind. My mom and grandmother get to another to safe house. Yet again, they're outed. Um, yet again, they're taken to be shot. And unfortunately, my mother, who today is 89 years old, will not share with us how they were saved the second time. She will take that story, unfortunately, to her grave, um, efforts notwithstanding. But here's what I want you to think about. The bystander sees the Jewish mom, the Jewish child, running, 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 and offers no assistance. So it's important to note the following, that if the bystander would have called the police the, or the, the, the authorities, the authorities would have been only too happy to come and you know, arrest, if not kill, my mom and grandmother. So there's a, this whole notion of, of what really would have, could a bystander have done in those days. And I think to give them a pass and to say nothing, I couldn't disagree with that more. There are those who suggest, well, you know, they were endangered. Here's the reality. Statistics show overwhelmingly that people who saved Jews were not harmed. That doesn't mean 100%. There was an expectation that bystanders would be harmed were they to help. But the truth be told, statistics on this are pretty clear that bystanders who provided assistance, like took, taking Jews in hiding, or offering them food, water, whatever, were not harmed. So please keep that in mind. So in the context of, of Hungary's um, Jewish Gentile relationship with my mom and grandmother, the bystander sees them running, didn't do anything. That's my mom, my father. My father was 19 years old and taken to um, a labor camp, a mining camp called Bor, B-O-R, which is located in the middle of Serbia. Um, it is, I now know, because I've studied it um, endlessly, was a horrific place. The camp commander was a sadist. He didn't shoot people, pew pew, because he needed them to work the iron because the, the, the bad guys needed the, you know, the iron for the war efforts, even when it was already late 44. What he did though, was he whipped prisoners to death. So he was a sadist. In November of 1944, some of you may know this, as the Russian army is coming from the east, the, the, begins the process of closing the, the camps, for instance, Bor. So here's, the, here's what happens. The camp has 10,000 Jews. The first group, 5,000, is sent back to Hungary. When they're sent back to Hungary, um, they're killed. It's a ruse. I mean, they're all massacred. My father, for reasons known, but to whomever, is in the second group. And he's taken from Bor to Nitsch. Nitsch is a town in central Serbia. And waiting for them in central Serbia are Tito's partisans, who, had set, who set up an ambush, killed most of the guards, unfortunately not all the guards, and unfortunately not the camp commander who unfortunately died late in life, peacefully surrounded by his loving family, truly unfortunately. And so now my father and others, um, I wouldn't say have been released, but are free to do what? And so my father, as I came to learn, leads a group of others um, clad um, with a shirt pants, no socks, shoes, no sweater, no coat, no hat, no gloves, no GPS, no Instagram, no Google Earth, no anything. And he sets off on this extraordinary 138 kilometer walk from Nietzsche in the middle of Serbia to Sofia in Bulgaria, where um, from there on to Palestine and the rest is history. But what's important for us? The one time that my father agreed to discuss this 138 kilometer um, walk with me, what he made very clear was from, as they were going from village to village to village and um, I mean, doing it, knowing that the Russians are coming, the Germans are coming, the Serbs are here, not knowing who's the enemy and who's the friend, probably no friends, lots of enemies. But what he did emphasize to me was the taunting of water, that the villagers would taunt them with water, show them water, retract the offer, show them water, retract the offer. Not one villager offered assistance. So for me, those are bystanders. I mean, these are clearly Jews and clearly in peril, you know, with the yellow star and so on, so on, so on obviously in prison's clothes, uh, ill-clad as ill-clad can be, and obviously in dire, dire, dire straits. And they made the conscious decision not to do anything. That for me is also a bystander. And just as I mentioned to you that my mother said that um, the bystander did not owe them a duty. My father made the exact same argument that from the perspective of the Serbian villager, um, my father and those with them were the other and no duty was owed to them. 
so disagreeing with one's parents is healthy. I utterly and totally disagree with my parents because not in the bike, not in the context of the bystander in terms of applying uh, legal culpability, but absolutely in terms of today's society, I refuse to give the bystanders a free pass. So I use, use a word I hate, I use the, the Holocaust um, bystander to apply it to contemporary society, which is why I've been so involved in legislative efforts around the country. And I raise my hand and I say, I will work with any, any legislator anywhere around the United States of America to criminalize the bystander as we're doing here and have done here in Utah, um, waiting for the governor's signature. And I think it's absolutely essential. That's hungry. Holland, here's food for thought for you in terms of the bystander in Holland. So we've all read the diary of, of Anne Frank a hundred million times and the Dutch have frankly have gotten away with this positive image of their role in terms of saving the Jews. Absolutely incorrect. The percentage of Jews who were killed in Holland in the Holocaust is extraordinary, 70 to 75%. That number is matched only by the number of, of Polish Jews who were killed. But we need to ask ourselves, how is it that in enlightened Holland, right? Renaissance Holland, um, Rembrandt and friends, how the hell is it that in a place like Holland, 70, 75, 70 to 75% of Jews are killed? And the answer, answer is, is simple. Um, meet with, interview Dutch men and women alike, who, as I have. And the answer is that the Dutch were a combination of obedient to the, to the occupation force, um, perhaps indifferent, perhaps they didn't like the Jews, and as a on the record interview with the former Dutch justice minister told me, we the Dutch are not brave people. And I, um, his name is Hirsch Balin, as I say, graciously granted me an on the record interview. That notion of not being a brave people, first of all, I applaud him for his, for his honesty, his candor. I think that is an important thing, to, an important concept to take into consideration when thinking about the bystander but, but I emphasize under no condition does that give the bystander a pass individually or collectively by saying we are not a brave people. And when you examine the role of the Dutch and when you examine Holland's role in the Second World War in the context of the Holocaust, it is as clear as clear can be clear that if not for the bystander, it would have been impossible for the, for the Nazis and their collaborators to have killed 70 to 75% of Dutch jury. So when I say to you that with all due respect to the perp, without the bystander, it would be absolutely impossible for the Holocaust to have occurred. And obviously, to Germany, if you write a book about the Holocaust, you can't not write about Germany. So I don't know how many of you know this, but Israelis of my generation, maybe one generation less, one generation more, um, until recently have not gone to Germany. And I was one of those Israelis who said, I will never go to Germany for all the obvious reasons. Until about 15 years ago, out of the clear blue sky, I got an email from a um, German colonel who invited me to come to spend three days with the German military based on something that I'd um, done while serving the Israel Defense Forces. In parentheses, I served for 20 years in the Israel Defense Forces, and I should have also added in parentheses, I commute between Salt Lake City and Jerusalem. But the German military invited me for three days um, to work with German commanders on something that I'd been involved with um, in the Israel Defense Forces. So we're going back and forth about the logistics and the logistics and, you know, and then he writes me, um, when you arrive at the Frankfurt airport, you walk you know, 50 steps this way to the right, 29 steps to the left, 32 steps straight ahead, and I will meet you on the train platform. And I, without thinking about it, instinctively wrote him back and said, I will not meet you on the train platform. And so I went to Germany. No, he didn't meet me in the train platform. He met me as soon as I got off the plane with a sign that said Professor Giora. And I spent three um, interesting days with the German military. It was, um, I need to add in parentheses within parentheses, I was brought by the German military to teach German commanders how to teach morality in armed conflict. Yes, the irony is rife bringing an Israeli officer to Germany to teach the Germans morality in armed conflict, but that's a different discussion. But as we're sitting having, you know, the obligatory um, whatever ale they drink, whatever the hell beer they drink, he says to me the following. 
you told me you won't meet me on the train platform. May I ask you why? And this guy was, you know, my age type thing. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, this is a teaching moment. And I said to him the following, I said, quote, because the last time your people invited my people to meet at the train platform, it didn't work out very well for my, for my tribe. And he looked at me and he said, oh my God, I've never thought about it that way. And that for me was a really powerful moment in the context of the bystander. Why? So as I was writing the book and I spent time in Germany and um, which was difficult, I wanna emphasize it was very difficult to write about the Holocaust in Germany, but it is what it is. I went to Wannsee. Those of you who have not been to Wannsee, a word about Wannsee. Wannsee is the place, beautiful conference center on Lake Wannsee, where in January of 41, the bad guys sat around a table, they had the obligatory either cognac or brandy, whatever the hell they drank, and decided on the final solution. It was on that day, January 20th, 1941, that the bad guys decided to kill my grandparents because my grandparents were murdered in Auschwitz on May 26, 1944. So we know a lot about Wannsee because Eichmann you know, was taking notes about what Heydrich said there. And here's the reality. When you look at the pictures of the Holocaust and the, the picture Nicole had was a great picture where you really wanna see the bystander is on the train platforms. So now I'm gonna jump from Wannsee where they decided on the final solution back to Hungary because I wanna take you to May 26, 1944, the day that my grandparents were murdered. My grandparents make the walk, they live in Eastern Hungary. They make the walk from their home, which I've found, I've, I've been there, to the train station where I've also been because I retraced their walk to the train platform. And here's what you see on the train platform. You see Jews being shoved onto the train, but what you really see, what catches your eye, what your eye cannot ignore, are the townspeople standing on the damn platform watching Jews being shoved onto trains. That, but the bystander on the train platform, for me, is in many ways the absolute essence of the bystander in the Holocaust. You see people who had been until 10 minutes ago, your neighbors, because some of the neighbors actually did the walk with you and they kind of like jeer you on. And they make their way to the, to the train station and they see you being shoved onto the train. But the same day that I found my father's house and went to the train platform um, in my father's hometown in Eastern Hungary, I also went to the Jewish cemetery in this godforsaken town. And there waiting for me, you cannot make any of this up, was a woman a little bit younger than me, whose late mother had been my parents' neighbor, my grandparents' neighbor on the day that um, they were deported. And I wanted to hear from this woman who was beyond gracious. She and her husband spent time with me trying to find my grandparents' name on this enormous, enormous memorial in this godforsaken town. And here's what she told me about the neighbors. The neighbors spat at, cursed at, jeered at my grandparents as they made the walk to the train station. Until five minutes ago, we were neighbors, and now all of a sudden, you know, spitting, jeering, cheering, um, you know, um, attacking you. That's a bystander. Uh, the name of the town, I, I will mispronounce it, uh, Ms. Blasky, is Nirehazem which I totally butcher. It is, a, it is a town in Eastern Hungary, an hour from the Ukrainian border. Oh my God, we'll talk later offline, Ms. Blasky. Um, they'll put online uh, for you all my email so we can chat um, later. That's extraordinary. Um, for me, spending the day there, train platform, taking then thinking about my father in the death march, my mother escaping, what I know about, what I've learned about, um, Holland, and obviously Germany being Germany. I want you to, to uh, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I leave to you. But I want you to consider that the essence of the bystander is that the bystander makes crime possible. And I know maybe perhaps some of you in this distinguished and huge audience are prosecutors, and I've met with prosecutors from different states around the country. 
And I know that the focus is on, is on the perpetrator, whether this crime or that crime. And I respectfully submit to you that the focus need not be exclusively on the perpetrator, but the focus really needs to be on the bystander. And here's why. Because the perp knows that he or she can commit a crime with impunity, immunity, because they'll be protected. And that's what the bystander does. The bystander protects. The bystander has made a decision that when there's a person who is vulnerable, so again, I'm referencing here in Utah, the legislation addresses children and vulnerable adults. We don't protect them for a zillion different reasons. That for me is not a viable option. And you also need to add, I don't know, if Nicole, if I mentioned to this, this to you, but you know that the best defense is a good offense. I know that there's criticism of my project in some, some quarters in the Jewish community um, that I quote unquote, use the Holocaust to tell a story about contemporary society. So, I mean, the, the, when that criticism was brought to my attention, I shared it with my mom, who as you now know is a Holocaust survivor. And my mom said to me the following, she said, if you know the Holocaust, if anything good can come out of a Holocaust, like bringing the, the bystander to the attention of the public, then keep, out, keep on talking about the Holocaust. So with my mom's blessing, I'm going to keep talking about it, criticism notwithstanding. The question is, what do we do with all this? So we can sit here and talk forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And the call in 20 years time can bring somebody else who talks about the, about the bystander and the Holocaust. Or we can say to ourselves, enough, and speak, no more. So that's going to require an individual and collective decision on the part of all of us. One of the obvious ways to do it is through legislation, which I'm, I'm a firm believer in the stick. I think it's important, you know, whack the bystander who doesn't act over the head. I think educational efforts are of great importance. Um, I've given talk, this talk to uh, children as young as sixth grade. Um, you know, you tailor the talk a little bit, you're a little bit sensitive, but um, talking to junior and high school students about it is absolutely critical. I last year gave a talk to 800 seventh and ninth graders here in Salt Lake City. Uh, safe to assume I was the first Jew they'd ever seen. Um, the questions they asked, I could still be there a year later answering their questions, which tells me the following, that there's a need to discuss the bystander. And I would like to think there's an increasing recognition that the essentialness of the bystander in crimes daily. Some of you will remember um, the Kitty Genovese story, put aside the fact that what the New York Times wrote in terms of the number of bystanders is incorrect. Some of you from first year of law school will remember David Cash and Jerry, Jeremy Strohmeyer. Those of you who don't remember, I'm going to quickly remind us, Cash and Strohmeyer are um, in high school. Strohmeyer's father invites them to spend the weekend with, with him in Vegas. Strohmeyer grabs um, a small child named Sharice Iverson. I mean, literally grabs her, drags her into the bathroom, closes the stall, I mean, goes in the stall, closes the door. Cash um, stands next to him, stall over, stands in the toilet, looks over, sees Strohmeyer uh, sexually assaulting Sharice Iverson. Um, Cash says to Strohmeyer, dude, what are you doing? Strohmeyer says, ah, don't worry about it. So Cash is relieved leaves the bathroom and catches up with Strohmeyer later and says to Strohmeyer, where is she? And Strohmeyer says to him the following, I raped her, strangled her, murdered her. So Strohmeyer is in um, jail for life. He got first degree, not death because he pled guilty. Cash, because there's no bystander law in Nevada is out and about, he's an entrepreneur. Um, embarrassing to say, but I've actually watched him a little bit on Facebook, which I know is embarrassing to say. And Therese Iverson was murdered. Teresa Iverson's murdered, A, because Jeremy Strohmeyer is a god-awful human being. Um, he's a monster. But David Cash could have, present, could have prevented it. That's a bystander. That person needs to be in jail. Another example, Vanderbilt University. A football player named Vandenberg has an on-off girlfriend. He brings her back to the dorm room, carries her, puts her on the floor. She's beyond inebriated. He texts his friends, the usual stuff you can imagine. She's here. She's free. Guys come over. She's raped and sodomized, but that's not interesting because I told you, I don't want to talk about the perpetrator. Sleeping on the upper bunk is a defensive back on the football team, a guy named Prelo. 
Vandenberg goes up to Prelo and shakes him, you know, like in the shoulder, trying to wake him up and tells him, you know, she's here, blah, blah. Prelo, in his own words, these are not my words, these are his words, says the following. I feigned sleep because it made me uncomfortable. Boo, who? In the middle of the night, when they're done raping, sodomizing this woman, Prelo comes from the, down from the upper bunk to the, um, to the floor of the dorm room and to the, you know, the dorm room floor. She's on the floor. She's naked, has vomit all over her. And what does our hero Prelo do? Leaves the room and goes to sleep across the hallway. Tennessee, there's no bystander law. So Prelo, like David Cash, gallivanting about, by the way, Prelo is like a professional traveler, blogger. Um, I've actually watched him. I mean, it, 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 there are no words to describe David Cash and no words to describe Mac Prelo. Um, yes, the purpose of the purpose and they're in jail, which is where they should be. But I remind you, Cash had the chance to intervene. Prelo had the chance to intervene. They were bystanders and they made the clear decision not to. That absolutely is a punishable crime without any doubt. And one of the things that I, I very much hope in talks like this, and this is why I'm so grateful to Nicole to give me the opportunity to meet with all of you, is to at least have this discussion and to galvanize people to say, what the hell do we do with the bystander? And there's no doubt whatsoever that as a second generation Holocaust survivor, that I now know my parents' story. I mean, now researched the hell out of my, fan, my parents' story. By the way, they never told each other their story. Um, I have to tell my mom, my dad's true story. I sit before you because you know I don't stand. I sit at the moment. I sit before you and I say, we don't have the luxury of saying, oh, this won't happen. And oh gosh, I know what I'll do. Maybe, but what do we do when you don't? And so, because I really do believe in, in legislating, I really believe in educating and I believe in combining the two together. I say, my friends, we've got to act against the bystander. And there are different ways to go about doing it but we don't have the luxury of time. And here's why we don't have the luxury of time. As we are speaking here, 1239 Pacific Standard Time, we all know, unless you don't follow the news, that somewhere somebody's just been sexually assaulted. Somebody's just been attacked. And the truth is that the bystander was there. And so before I turn it over um, to questions, I would like to leave you with the following thought. The, I don't know how many of you are sports fans, but maybe the metaphor will, will work for you. And I know you have a great football team and I know all about Russell Wilson's, will he stay or will he go, right? Like the song by The Clash. The perpetrator is the running back running to the end zone. Waiting in the end zone is the victim. The, the, the perpetrator running back has a wall around him who protects him who ensures that he will get to the end zone untouched because those who are part of the wall have made the decision to protect the perp rather than to protect the person to whom they owe a duty. And that is to the survivor. On that note, my friends, I respectfully turn it over to questions. Um, however the hell you wanna ask questions, here I am, fire away. Nicole? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you so much. That was um, absolutely a fantastic presentation. And, uh, you know, I myself am a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. And I think one of the big questions that always comes up for me is how could something like this happen? Um, but I definitely think it can be applied to a lot of current day events. And uh, I feel like we could probably have this conversation for hours. So um, maybe we'll have to have you back another time. Um, so I'm going to start with a first question here. Um, I have my colleagues sending me some. I know we have a lot of fantastic questions right now. And um, as um, Amis said, um, you know, we will give uh, his email at the end. And if you have additional questions, you are welcome to email him and he is happy to answer you. So that's fantastic. Um, the first question I have for you is when the perpetrator is the state, what can the bystander do? When the perpetrator is the state, I mean, that's the obvious question in the context of, of, the, um, of the Holocaust, that in those days, if you would have called the police, the authorities, the authorities would have been only too happy to come and to um, 
to kill the Jews. So that's a, that's what makes the bystander and the, the Holocaust complicated. But let's go to society today. And it's an excellent question if you think about society today. So my college roommate is a Presbyterian pastor in Cleveland who has turned his church over to be a sanctuary church. He's giving um, haven to a woman against whom there's a deportation order because she's here illegally. So um, from his perspective, from his perspective, is the perp the state perhaps? Um, but he has made the conscious decision to be um, not to be a bystander. Is he running afoul of the law? Absolutely, yes. Um, and I um, think that in those instances, you, you know, you have to make a, a conscious, a moral decision with yourself. Who are you going to protect? My college roommate, um, the, I mean, he's not my pastor because he's not Presbyterian, but made the de clear decision to um, not enable the state to enforce laws that he believes, believes are illegal. Is he engaged in civil disobedience? Absolutely. I told him to put on his speed dial uh, name of a lawyer and to have his orange jumpsuit ready because he's committing a crime, but he is, he is willing to commit that crime in order to protect the person. The question of the state as complicit, the state as perp is, you know, is a great, great question. And it, a lot of it is gonna depend on, you know, do you look at Thoreau in terms of civil di disobedience, you know, on Walden Pond, how do you perceive your interaction with the state, your interaction with the person, with the person in peril? On that one, that's a great question. No easy answer. Thank you. Um, here's another really good one. Does the bystander law provide immunity to the person who intervenes and makes the situation worse? So an example, they perform CPR, but not very well, and the person dies. Sure, like a good Samaritan law, which says that if I provide assistance to the best of my capability in good faith, then um, there's no prosecution. And also in the, the law that was passed here on Friday, there are um, mitigating factors for you know clergy, doctors, and people um, who, if they act, they would be harming themselves. And so we do have mitigating language, yes. Okay, um, how can a bystander law be implemented? Uh, how would it be applied in cases such as George Floyd's case? It seems to me that the bystander responsibility needs to be more implemented at the school level, level, promoting school activism, teaching empathy and compassion specifically for minorities or the little guy in our communities. So let's begin with George Floyd. First of all, um, um, the police officer Shabas and the others are, 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 the trial has begun or the jury selection has begun this past, this week or last week. Um, the, um, in the state of Minnesota actually, there is an obligation on police officers who if they see another police officer committing a crime, they have the obligation to intervene. That same um, provision exists, the Department of Justice manual number 1234, directive 5678, which imposes on police officers who see um, a fellow officer committing a crime have the obligation to intervene. That obviously the officers who saw Chavis uh, killing George Floyd didn't do, um, um, obviously. The, but the larger question in terms of broader society um, is, the absolute requirement in addition to um, the legislation is also the obligation to educate. I mean, it's, it's, it's a combined effort. Um, and we're, I think we're well aware of it that we're going to have to educate the public that you see a vulnerable child, you see, a, a, I'm sorry, a child and a vulnerable adult in peril, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to act. Um, and um, that will um, enable you that enable the state to prosecute, and it's going to be it's a class B misdemeanor. Um, but in addition to being a class B misdemeanor, um, in certain in certain situations, it will also lead to professional sanction and professional discipline, which I think is 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 of the of great importance, because it makes it clear to the bystander who doesn't report, who fails to report, that there are indeed um, real consequences. But I, again, it's going to require a very significant educational undertaking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this question is from Kelly. How do you deal with the bystanders who may be in a state of shock or confusion about events happening around them, especially when those are large scale events? Right. So there, there's also going to be um, prosecutor exercise of prosecutorial discretion as to when someone can be can be prosecuted, can be prosecuted. Um, but you're right, and there's also the, the there's a diffusion theory in in, in the bystander um, studies which says the following, the more people there are, the less they will respond. The fewer people there are, the more the people are willing to respond because the diffusion theory says that I, always, I will assume someone else will act. In terms of people being in shock, you know, you're gonna to have to convince the prosecutor that you didn't understand the situation. The burden will be on you to convince. 
Um, okay, we're going to go with another question. Give me one second. Can I, can I do you want me to also respond to the in the chat room? Um, or no. There were a couple here in the chat. I've got Alana. Um, I'll leave that to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Alana is my secret person behind the scenes sending me questions. Um, so give me one second just to pull out the next one. Um, hold on a second. Uh, okay, one second. She's sending me a next question just because we have so many. So we just, uh, it's good to have someone sending me. Um, Okay, this one is from Arthur. Is there any degree of clear risk to the bystander that can uh, excuse an action at the time? Or yes. is he, she always, and under all circumstances, obliged to act to help the victim? Right, so there's, going back to the previous um, question, um, th that question ties into the previous question, um, that there's exercise of prosecutorial discretion, that if, if the prosecutor reaches the conclusion that if the bystander would have acted, it would have brought harm onto him or his family, then there's no obligation to act. But again, the burden's on you to prove it. Okay. The next one here is from Eric. Um, which of your books would you recommend as the most in-depth analysis of all the factors that would go into creating legal framework for bystander liability? So the easy answer is that the two books together the crime of complicity in the armies of enablers, because the armies of enablers, which we didn't discuss, is in, on some level, um, uh, I don't like the word, but sequel to the to the to the bystanders book, because the the second was in enablers. Both books address um, uh, um, um, not a recipe, call it, but guidelines and suggestions how to go about criminalizing. And I look at different states that there. I see that one of the questions: ten states have this, twenty eight countries have have this. So the, the two books together can, can well um, be used by those who are interested in the legislative process. Okay, and just so everyone knows, um, we I think we're gonna put the names and links of the book in the post event email. So if anyone's interested in reading um, either of these books, uh, it'll be available to you. And I'm currently reading um, Amos's uh, book on uh, the crime of complicity. It's very interesting. Um, still haven't finished it, sorry. <laughs> so our next question here is um, from Michelle. Uh, have colleges and universities started implementing discipline policies to hold bystanders accountable? It seems like institutional policy would be a good place to begin influencing where legislation doesn't yet exist. One, I'm not sure who's asking the question. Whoever it is, is not 100% correct. He, she, it, they are a million percent correct. Um, I'm of the firm belief that institutions, you know, universities, Catholic church, big time corporations, law firms need to have clear policy that a, a bystander slash enabler tying the two books together who fails to protect the person in peril. Um, I don't see why that person shouldn't be thanked for their services and shoved out the door. If we do not become aggressive, assertive, aggressive, aggressive in polite English, assertive polite English, with respect to the bystander, the, the enabler, nothing's gonna change. Um, if I can for a second, in the book, The Armies of Enablers, I spent 15 months interviewing 20 to 25 sexual assault survivors at Michigan State, Ohio State, Catholic Church, USA Gymnastics. I asked them one question, which is what were your expectations of the enabler? Enabler is distinct from the bystander. The enabler wasn't present, but is told or should know. And the one answer they had was they expected to be protected and they weren't. And then I asked them, what's the one word that defines how you feel? Um, and the one word is abandoned because they were abandoned by the person who they expected to, to protect them. In the context of institutions, I mean, again, I military, police, law, I emphasize law firms, um, colleges, football teams, basketball teams, USA Gymnastics, uh, you know, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, U US Olympic Committee. The bystander, no matter, enabler, no matter how high the food chain at Michigan State University, the former president, former, fortunately, she's now the former president, resigned was resigned you know depends how you want to look at it the exec, former executive director of the usa gymnastics steve penny um, um was fired or resigned picture poison um under investigation these are terrible people mm -hmm. and the perpetrator knows that they are going to be protected it's all about institutional complicity and i, I again I, you know nicole because we're supposed to be polite so we're going to call it assertive in real life it's actually aggressive and in really impolite English, I hope not to offend, sorry, not to offend. These are people who need to have their rear ends kicked. 
um, because all that's going to happen otherwise is the perp will continue perpetrating. Yeah, I have to say, I went to Michigan State University, and it's pretty an embarrassing situation that occurred. So, by the um, way, in, in parentheses, Nicole, I'm writing a new book about the the next sexual assault, assault scandal um, that's going to explode or is exploding is at the University of Michigan. Um, over the course of 50 years, one doctor um, sexually assaulted, abused, raped between five to seven thousand University of Michigan football players. Nine hundred of them have filed oh. lawsuits. I am writing a, a new book with one of them whose name is John Vaughn, who was raped between 40 to 50 times. That's that's pretty that's really awful. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm really glad that you are doing this work and bringing this attention. I, you know, I always think about you know, especially what you're just saying in relation to, um, you know, people felt like they would be protected. And I think about even in you know the you know people that the German Jews that served in World War One and thinking that they would be protected because they had you know been given an iron cross and they were true german citizens and well, in the end to realize <laughs> that those protections were just not there um you know that kind of came up to me so we have time for a couple more questions a few more questions actually so if you don't mind um Please. i'll keep going is that okay away. okay so um there's a bunch but this one actually was um i'm I know Alana has another one, but someone put this in the chat that I actually thought was interesting. Um, what do you, is there a, a country out there that you feel like is the gold standard on bystander accountability? Is there, Germany. I, mean, I haven't even heard of this before. Germany. So I'd be curious to know too. Germany, Germany, Germany recently prosecuted, um, the story goes like this. A guy, even older than me, cause I'm old, the guy who's in the eighties goes to the bank to the, um, ATM machine puts the damn, you know, the card in the ATM machine and collapses of a heart attack. He's now on the ground. Everything I'm telling you is on YouTube. Um, and person A, he's alive, but he's, he's, he's had a heart attack. He's on the floor. Person A steps over him because he's in the way. So you step over him. Person B steps over him because, you know, gosh, he's, on, he's in the way. You know, gosh, he dies. The two people... Um, German bystander law, there's no incarceration, but there's a very significant um, financial penalty. And uh, German uh, German prosecutor, I, I don't remember which state it was in Germany, um, levied a very, very significant penalty on, on um, both of these god-awful um, bystanders. I mean, first of all, who the hell steps over another person? Um, there have been prosecutions in Italy in Holland, but the facts are so damn um, confusing. The call it would take an hour to explain the facts, but this German case is, is a classic example. By the way, in Israel, I told you I commute between here and um, Salt Lake City in Israel. We have this law and we had a chance a couple of years ago to absolutely prosecute um, a couple of fellows who saw a woman kayaking in the Yarkon River in Tel Aviv, the kayak overturns and she's struggling, struggling, struggling. And they are just, oh, boo hoo. Um, and I was really, really uh, disappointed, which is the, the, play, the play word, right? Disappointed that the um, prosecutors, the attorney generals did not uh, prosecute them. This was, a, this was a miss. This was a big time miss for reasons that I don't really understand. That's really interesting. I don't know, I'm definitely, um, uh, I have a psychology degree. So I, I learned about, you know, the bystander effect in, in college. And it, it always in the back of my mind, whenever I see something happen, and I won't lie, I've, I've seen people walk over people that were on the ground and it always baffles me um, when people don't stop to help others. Like it's just so easy. So um, here's another good question. It's a good legal question is, doesn't shifting the burden on the bystander to prove uh, mitigating circumstances negate their right in a criminal matter to being innocent until proven guilty? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We're trying to find the balance with prosecutors. I need to add that the defense bar is um, fully on board with the bill that was passed on Friday, um, which focuses on, on children and vulnerable adults, the whole reporting mechanisms. Um, I understand the question, but we've also met with prosecutors who understand there's going to be, you know, under the microscope on this and trying to strike some kind of a balance. But we do feel, and this was, you know, passed by the legislature here. I mean, you wanna see bipartisanship in action on Friday, it was 27 in favor, zero against, and four abstentions. I don't wow. need to tell all of you that in today's political climate to have such overwhelming bipartisanship is extraordinary. But yeah. to the question, yes, there, there is some, there, I understand the question, but I have um, confidence that the prosecutors will only go forward when they're absolutely convinced that the person was in a position to act. Um, 
does that mean that they'll be, you know, lenient? Yes, no, that I leave to them. That's why they're prosecutors. I'm just, you know, the, the teacher, professor type thing. Um, but I, I, I do understand the question, but I think we've struck the, the balance here. Yeah, that's, that's great to, to hear how, the, how that passed. Um, here's, I'm gonna do one more last question and then I have a, I wanna share a comment that was a uh, comment here. Um, this one is from Robert on Facebook. So um, I'm actually really excited to say for all those that are here today, we have, we had uh, over 400 people, 400 households watching right now and a number of people on Facebook. So this is very exciting. Um, Robert asks, is the legal moral distinction a responsibility to act based on physical distance alone? Right. That, so that's actually a great way to finish, at least from my perspective. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Great. But I asked it last. <laughs> when I started the project and, you know, when you do a, a start a book, you do um, talks here, there and everywhere. And one of the questions I was asked, what about the bystander who's sitting at home and watching, you know, some the, the latest brutality in Syria? I'm watching it on CNN. And what do I do? I see something on Facebook. And I made the conscious decision. I mean, I thought about long and hard that the bystander for me is the person who is there who physically sees it. We, I don't know how many of you Facebook, I don't, but I'm told by people who Facebook actively that X percentage of the things you see on Facebook aren't really happening. They're, they're, they're dummied, they're um, you know, manufactured. And I came to the conclusion, at least for me, that the bystander is person A who sees person B in peril. And it's for me, it's that one-to-one -one relationship. Um, in both books, I created this triangle of perpetrator, victim, bystander, or enabler. And for me, it's about person A and about person B. I've been accused of reordering or restructuring the, the social contract that you know Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau talked about. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not pompous enough to tell you I'm restructuring the social order, but I am willing to tell you, no doubt um, clearly framed by my parents' experiences that, um, sorry for my English, Nicole, but I am here to kick some serious ass. And, um, and I mean that, um, and otherwise nothing will change. And for me, Mr. Robert, it's about you and the other person. I need to also add, I've been a bystander um, three times in my life. Um, I twice failed. Um, there was a child in peril and I ignored. There was a, a um, um, homeless person who was assaulted by a college student. And the third time I actually saved someone's life, yay for me. Um, I'm not a hero. I hate that designation. I saved someone's life. Yay for me. Um, but I mean, I'm no different from anybody else and you're no different from me. And the, concept, the decision you have to ask yourself, the, 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 the dilemma in front of you, do I walk away or do I not walk away? And if you walk away, if you see a child in peril or a, a vulnerable adult, you walk away from my perspective, dude, best place that waits for you is the bed and breakfast will they'll feed you a warm, a warm meal three times a day behind bars. My take. Well, um, I think it was a great question to kind of to end with. And I, I want to end with this last comment before I close. Um, this was really, uh, I think, such a such an important talk. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we should continue having this conversation. Um, so I want to end with this. Uh, this is from uh, one of our attendees uh, that says, I hope you continue to talk to young people on this topic. We were brought up to stand up for others and with the decades of hindsight, of hindsight, I've seen that my parents were two of the most morale people I've ever met. I've wondered all my life why it isn't more obvious to people that if everyone did a little to intervene, so much suffering wouldn't even happen. I've decided that they weren't taught that. Perhaps, please continue to spread your message. We all need to hear it. I think that was like a great, a great way for us to end and really moving comment. I don't know who wrote that, but thank you for saying that. Um, and Amos, thank you so much uh, for joining us today um, for this really thought provoking program. Um, it's, you know, we talk a lot about bystanders and upstanders at the center, which is why I started the presentation how I did. Um, we end our exhibit, Finding Light in the Darkness, talking about upstanders. We have an upstander wall. And, uh, and it's focused on youth because youth, youth are our future, right? And if we don't teach the young people out there why it's important to stand up for those around them, you know, we won't have that tolerant, empathetic you know, society that I spoke about earlier. 
Um, I want to thank everyone who is watching for joining us today. Uh, and just a reminder that if you are joining us and you'd like to receive Washington State Bar CLE credit, um, please fill out the program evaluation. I made it much easier this time for you. Um, so you just need to fill that out with your bar number and your name, letting me know that you'd like the CLE credit. And please submit that within the next two weeks so I can send everything to the bar. In addition, if you have questions for Amos, you can uh, take his email and he has, as I said, agreed to um, uh, answer your emails. I think we're also going to send him any unanswered questions because we had, I am looking here, about 50 questions. So we clearly didn't get through all of them. Um, and, you know, Amos, if you want to try to, you know, get through all of them sure. and answer them, you're welcome to do I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, you also posted the links to the to the two books. Yes, we'll do that in the post event. So everyone that's on here, look out for the post event email because we'll have the survey um, and we'll also have links to the books and um, the email address. So uh, in addition to that, I just want to uh, remind everyone that we have a really fantastic upcoming uh, Lunch and Learn series the next three weeks on America and the Holocaust in partnership with Pacific Lutheran University. So we hope you'll join us. And please save the date on April 8th, which is not a Tuesday, it's a Thursday. We are going to be doing a really, really special program uh, for Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's also called Yom HaShoah. We're going to be inviting all of you to join us, bring a candle, and we're all going to be lighting a candle together. I think it's going to be really incredible and a really special way to remember those that were lost and were victims of the Holocaust. So again, thank you, Amos. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic day. And uh, think about the bystander, I guess. Help someone. Thanks for, having, thanks for having me. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone.